Today's review is Parasite the Maxim. Parasite is a sci-fi horror action anime about a boy named Shinichi Izumi who one day finds himself with a parasitic-like being for a right hand. The parasite had previously tried to take control of his brain, but failed to do so and as such had to learn to coexist with Shinichi with his consciousness still intact. Shinichi being a very nervous and shy boy obviously freaks out a lot and doesn't cope with this problem well, as I'm sure most any normal human being would do but eventually learns to deal with it over the course of the series. His new right hand, aptly named Migi, threatens that if Shinichi tries to expose his secret that he would kill his loved ones. This is because he is afraid that he would be turned into a lab rat or possibly exterminated. But that's not the only problem Shinichi faces, as Migi is not the only parasite. A series of murders have also been going around where victims were cut into shreds, which Shinichi quickly figures out is the work of other parasites. Thus begins his new life, where he not only has to keep the secret of Migi from anyone, but also survive any encounters with other parasites. It's a good start to the show for sure, as the series doesn't waste much time exposing him to the possible dangers and threats he may face. The first couple of action scenes with the parasites in particular were fun to watch, as you learned how the parasites engaged in battle with each other. However, much of the tension is lost after a while because Migi can simply sense when enemies are approaching him, which basically is a switch saying, it's action time, rather than making things a little less predictable. The inclusion of a dubstep soundtrack also ensures that the series will always be more action related than horror. Not that I have anything against dubstep, but it is the very opposite of subtle, and it makes every situation a lot more wild rather than scary or strange. Another problem is that the enemies don't really evolve much in terms of how they fight as time goes on, as they all basically have the same long blade ability that they fling around at max speed. So really, the only thing interesting about combat is when Migi and Shinichi are discussing whatever strategy they are going to use to win. Other than that, basically every fight feels even more familiar because none of the enemies he fight against really offer much character, build-up, or development. This is another problem with a series that I'll tackle later entirely, but in short, without proper build-up or characterization, it's impossible to get very invested in any fight the show has. The only attempt the show tries to do with this is the final fight, which ends up being the most laughable fight in the entire series. Not only is his opponent as shallow as they come, with very little motivation for either to even be fighting against each other, but also how he is defeated and the whole battle is just the most brainless exchange the series has to offer. Once again, I'll cover this in full detail later because I feel like this fight deserves special attention in particular. Overall, the fights are forgettable and really don't serve to raise much tension whatsoever. It's sad when I can say another show by Madhouse, Chihaya Furu, which is simply a card tournament show, has far more tension conveyed with no life on the line in general. Sure, the show has gore, but it's poorly utilized gore. It really serves no purpose other than to say, well, that's nasty, which is among the most childish uses of the device. Gore, when properly used, can convey how extreme an opponent or situation is and has a real effect on character's mental state. However, this is never properly done as Shinichi is more focused on other problems and the students of his school that were exposed to the same thing were, are never shown being affected by it much. It just goes to show that using gore doesn't automatically mean that your series is mature. Now let's begin with the biggest problem in the whole show, the characters. To start off with, let's take Shinichi. Shinichi starts off as shy and nervous, like previously stated, but after Migi enters his life, he becomes more complacent. For example, he had a fear of bugs right from the first episode, but soon after, this fear fades. So one could say he slowly becomes less human as the show goes on. One could say that, but if you couldn't figure that out for yourself, no worries, the show will make extra certain, and it will drill it into your head if you couldn't figure it out. His girlfriend, for example, will constantly be asking him, Are you Shinichi Izumi? Due to his sudden odd changes. The first time was fine, but she will repeat it constantly, almost as if she has nothing else to say. Eventually, Shinichi himself begins to question if he still even has his emotions left. This would be fine, but like said with his girlfriend, the problem is repeatedly stated throughout the whole series on how strange he's acting that it quickly becomes redundant before long. There's only so much angst about being emo about not being emo enough that I can take. 
and of course he finally realizes he's still human in the end and gains his lost tears back and blah blah blah, it's cheesy. Overall, most of his characterization was over by the time he started looking like Okabe, so the show had no choice but to repeat itself constantly. Then we have Miki, his iconic partner. Miki really only cares about one thing throughout the show, and that is Miki. He also has to remind Shinichi of this because the author thinks the audience is that forgetful, but he basically is there to be his living scouter for anyone with massive power levels running about. This is later changed because Miki has to go to sleep for four hours a day at random times because of having to fuse with his heart to save his life. Yeah, that happens. But mostly it's just an excuse to ramp up tension because the author must have realized the scouter situation was far too predictable. At first I thought they were going to have a slightly more interesting relationship, but it really doesn't go anywhere. He's essentially a robot for most of the show, and while I admit I do quite like how he was animated, I really don't feel like much personality was conveyed by him. Sure, he can be intimidating at times, but it's all pointless because his conversations with Shinichi are repetitive. It's a running thing in the show, by the way. He uses logic while Shinichi uses emotion. He's essentially a robot until the very end. The most laughable thing this show does is it tries to act like they were great buddies and that Shinichi had any affection for Migi. This is never conveyed in the show whatsoever, nor is this warranted. I would wait until the plot section, but I'd figure I'd mention it here. There's a bit where Shinichi wants to tell his father about Migi because he thinks he's dead. He wants to say to his father what a great guy Migi was. This is so stupid, it can only be called Stockholm Syndrome. First of all, Shinichi's life has turned into a wreck ever since Migi has arrived in it. Second of all, Migi has threatened him constantly throughout the show, telling him that he would murder his father and his girlfriend if he talks about him. But for some reason, now they have a great friendship. Even more hilarious is when Migi says they had a lot of good memories together, like all the murder and death they experienced. Funny enough, the show does not flash back any of the so-called memories like a show usually would do at these moments. Because it knows. It knows there's no memories. The decision to humanize Miyagi was silly and a predictable way to make the ending separation between the two seem more powerful and emotional than it really was. Quite honestly, since Miyagi was so set on survival and seemed to be borderline super genius, I was hoping to see him manipulate Shinichi or something, more into doing things he wanted to get him out of the troublesome situations that Shinichi always seemed to find himself in. But alas, they go with the most predictable development possible because Reiko showed that parasites can have emotions a few episodes earlier. This would have been fine overall if it didn't happen so quickly and there were ways it could have been done, I think. For example, when Migi had finally detached from Shinichi, that could have been a time to actually make him feel a sense of loneliness, I mean he feels it anyway, and realize that being Shinichi, being with him, wasn't so bad after all. However, to spur all this emotional talk like some big thing was going on between the two was far too much to ask for me. Overall, the interplay between the two wasn't nearly as interesting as I originally thought it would be. And then we get to the best character in the show. The one thing about the show I'm gonna praise, and that is Reiko. Reiko is a parasite who originally poses as a school teacher and wants to keep her social standing and wasn't quite as interested as the other parasites in eating other humans for whatever reason they do because it's never really fully explained why they want to eat other humans when they could just, you know, eat food. But I, I guess the reason is they underestimate humans, whatever. Interestingly enough, she also chooses to have a baby with her current body, just for experimentation purposes primarily and because she's curious. This is the only decently written character in the show, as not only is she not redundantly written in any way, but most of her actions are genuinely curious to some degree. While her development still plays out somewhat predictable, I still feel overall she was easier to sympathize with than any of the other characters in the show. And in my book, that makes her a winner. At first, Reiko sees human as scum, who she has no qualm with eradicating, but eventually she becomes very intrigued with their behavior. This leads to her actually showing not only respect, but also a degree of care for them as well. She even develops a motherly sort of love towards her baby, which is very unexpected otherwise as the parasites don't care about anyone but themselves. 
but unfortunately she also serves to highlight how none of the villains are even remotely this level of depth. Also, I don't care how our deaths what basically we used as an excuse for Migi to get random last minute development. Though it was an effective way to show Shinichi that just because they're parasites doesn't automatically mean they're all evil. I do wish Reiko basically didn't have to say it straight as the scene where she died basically spoke the message for itself. But it's still easily the best scene in the entire show. Episode 17 and 18 in general blow all the episodes out of the water. And these two episodes genuinely created some degree of emotion for me, which I think is worth applauding. Overall, my main complaint with her character is I would have preferred her to be the main antagonist as she's easily the most interesting character in the show, having potential screen time stolen by all the less important parasites that don't have any effect at all was a huge mistake in my opinion, as I feel her character development was also a bit too scattered and rushed. But overall, if there's anything the author should be applauded for, it's definitely this part of the show. Then there's Murano, Shinichi's girlfriend. Like stated before, she is a very dry character who basically states the same thing all the time. The only aspect we ever see of her is her worrying about him. We never really get a good vibe of who she is or what she does other than that, so really she just fills in the romantic love interest subplot that all anime desperately need to have for some reason. I love a good romance, I do. But these two clearly have next to no chemistry whatsoever. Even when she tries to be somewhat playful, Shinichi remains usually unresponsive. It makes every interaction basically play out the same way of him hiding something from her and that makes her uncomfortable. They eventually break up, then of course they get back together and yada yada yada. It's as predictable as you think it is. It's a typical Spider-Man, Superman relationship. There's just no fun to be had here and the show was better off not even having a love interest for Shinichi as she's part of the reason the show is even more redundant than it already was in the first place. Then there's Kana, who somehow manages to be even worse written than Murano. She also is another token love interest so that some self-insertion could be done in this series. I'm not sure why, because I thought part of the point was that Shinichi was supposed to be in a crappy situation so we could relate to his feelings more easily, but now I think the series wanted to be a power fantasy of some sorts with all the girls that are into him. There's actually two more, but they are never expanded upon, and all the thugs he ends up beating up. To, it just it's like do you want to be a power fantasy or do you want to you know make us feel for this guy I, I don't really know um, I hope I hope it wasn't trying to be a power fantasy but it's certainly gave me that vibe but anyway on to Kana she's a girl with psychic powers who can somehow sense parasites she takes this power as something that is pointing her to her one true love instead of course this is never explained ever I've heard of people in anime who can sense spirits, which I can buy somewhat, but parasites? Really? How? I don't get it. Apparently, Murano also had this power to a small degree, but that also is never expanded upon, of course. Anyway, because she can tell where Shinichi is at times, she decides that she wants him to be her soulmate, just like that. While she appeared to have more personality than Murano at first, the author didn't really do anything with her character, making her even more dull as a result. She's obsessed with Shinichi and even ends up stalking him, despite absolutely no real interaction or chemistry between the two either. Every conversation they have is basically Shinichi warning her not to approach the things she senses, and she just blows him off. Literally every single conversation they have. They don't say anything else. But apparently the show felt that was enough for her to not only develop a deep attachment for him, but also that how Shinichi should be attached to her as well. That's why when her death scene comes about, somehow tries to make it seem deeply emotional, like she was an important character or something. However, all it did was really question on why was she even in the show at all. And I'll tell you why. And also she suspected that he was cheating on her with her which was pointless because this has already been shoved down our throats enough as it is, and really serves to undermine a character's death. The only reason I thought Kana existed was because she would eventually be the main heroine, because it would have been the cliche, she's the only one who understands him, but uh, what actually plays out is even more underwhelming and laughable. It just serves to add another plot hole along with drama bait, just shows how little the author actually cared about her as a character. 
Much like Murano, we never get to know her and she was just another cute face. Why was she hanging out with delinquents anyway? What was her life like outside of all this? How did she think about other things? This show never answers these questions with any character but Shinichi, Migi, and Reiko, and thus they are the only characters that deserve any attention at all. As for the rest of the characters, they're all forgettable and shallow as can be. None of the parasites really have any motivation for any of the fights they engage in other than they feel like it or they are stupid and underestimate humans. And the side characters lack any real presence. Let's take the political unit formed by the Parasite Committee of... Parasites. Or something. This is never expanded upon. Why do they form this committee? Why does the mayor want humans dead so bad? Funny enough about the big plot twist with the mayor being human also shows how little care was put into the writing. It seemed like a big twist, but really, who gives a shit? We know nothing about this person or what reason he has to hate humans so bad. He gives some speech about humans sucking or whatnot and then is quickly killed off. This wasn't even build up, this is just random. All the side characters basically make about as much impression as this guy, which is to say, no impression at all and no real valuable input. And now we get to the plot, or what little it has anyway. It's more of an episodic monster of the week show with the overarching Shinichi dealing with his humanity and Reiko dealing with hers. They tried to have a parasite council of sorts like I said before, but we learn absolutely nothing about it. Nothing. And all in all, there's really isn't much story here to talk about in the first place. So instead, we'll talk about the lousy execution. The plot is primarily controlled by two things. Coincidence and doing things for the sake of drama. Nothing feels natural in the plot development whatsoever. To explain what I mean, let's take a look at the very first big incident in the show. Shinichi's parents decide they want to go on vacation. Shinichi tries to oppose to this because he's worried about the parasite attacks that have been happening around the town, but he can't really explain this to his parents. Migi proceeds to explain this that the chance of them dying would be much lower with them out of the city because parasites would primarily want to be in the city as there are more hosts available for feeding on. Therefore, Shinichi allows his parents to go off and they are given the biggest death flag ever. It just so happens that at the same time, a random parasite is off in the exact same countryside they are planning to visit. This is because it took control of a guy's girlfriend and allowed him to move her into the countryside as they went on vacation. After the parasite is seen playing with a seatbelt it doesn't know how to use and they proceed to fly off the road. The girl's body that the parasite had resided in is thus damaged so badly that it has to take over the boyfriend's body instead. This leaves it walking around on the road not trying to hitchhike or anything because it possibly doesn't know how. However, because it took control of a body that is male and it only knows how to control females, it needs to take on another new host. It spots Shinichi's parents and takes control of his mother's body as a result. This is not coincidence. This is not foreshadowing. This? is pure bullshit. And unfortunately, that's pretty much how every arc is for the most part. It couldn't be more predictable and lame if it tried. Take Kana, how does she die? She walks into her own death by her own unexplainable death trap powers. How does Origami escape at the end to cause the kidnapping of his girlfriend? Because some investigator thought it would be a great idea to uncuff the crazy guy who had no use for his hands in the situation in the first place. Plot-induced stupidity and convenience can only be taken so far, and this show has it all over the place. I also have to mention in the episodes right before the big fight with the final boss, because that's what he is. He has no character to be worth calling anything else. Shinichi starts freaking out all over the place because he might be killed. Even though he has already been in life or death situations the whole show, somehow it's a whole nother level of problem here. But once again, because this fight had no adequate build up and motivation for the two to be really fighting each other, it decided to do this in order to up the tension in the silliest fashion possible. All it does is make Shinichi look like the biggest loser ever and the show already did that, who even needs comfort sex to feel better. Now in theory, this could work, but not the way it was executed. I imagine Shinichi pulling this kind of response if he did something he regretted, like accidentally killing another human. But just because a final boss has a power level over 9 billion apparently that warrants this kind of response, and of course the final boss is beaten by sheer plot convenience, see the trend here? by stabbing him with a random metal that apparently has poison in it. Once again, more bullshit writing, but if that wasn't enough, he also randomly absorbs Migi when Migi was dying, 
because that was such a great idea, right? Of course Migi rebels inside of him and cuts him apart, causing him to lose. This is never explained on why he even did the thing in the first place. By the way, Shinichi's character really jumped off the deep end in its entirety during this fight, as the only reason he snuck up on him to fight him in the first place without Migi was because he had a good feeling about this. And of course, something good does happen. Perhaps he's a hidden psychic too! And just for one final plot hole that should be mentioned is Shinichi starts randomly having dreams with Miji inside him. The reason these dreams happen is never explained, but I suppose it's just to show varying perspectives or something, but I really don't want to give it that much credit. Once again, the only reason is so it can have Migi's goodbye take place in an emotional way. But this isn't really foreshadowing, as much as the writer simply slapping in content for the sake of it. At the end of the series, Migi is seen having to fall asleep for a very long time, but also to give Shinichi a rest because of all the shit he had to go through because of him. Though he of course pops up one more time when he needs it at the end just because. At the end of the day, the show just does whatever it wants to make things seem entertaining. Though, hilariously enough, that's not even where the plot really falls off the deep end. At the very end of the show, it decides it wants to start being philosophical. For some reason, a series about murdering parasites, which show no real reason to sympathize with them outside of Reiko, decides it has an environmental message, a human suck message, and humans are arrogant. This comes out of nowhere, as the way it expresses human sucking was that pollution and trying to say they under, uh, understand other species, rather than the bigger problem that occurred, such as when the armed forces killed innocent civilians just for the sake of wiping out the parasites. That's no biggie though, pollution. <laughs> but no, at the end of the series, the series just blatantly spews its pretentious bullshit several times when it's lacking any sort of thought or coherence to whatever is going on. Why in the world it feels it needs to do this, I have no clue. Funny enough, this show actually did have a character spew bullshit about Shinichi turning himself in, him and Migi in, for the good of humanity so they could be examined so they could take out parasites. Some random investigator dude who is underwhelming and hardly worth mentioning quite honestly. However, he then backpedals and apologizes for spewing this bullshit towards him because he realized he didn't much put much thought into it, you know? As such, the show kind of teaches us that characters who spew bullshit randomly like this really shouldn't be listened to in the first place. The mayor does the same thing, and so does Origami in the last episode. So, if anything, I guess the message is, don't listen to a single thing this show has to say. If it wanted to have a coexistent argument, and neither side was necessarily evil, that would be fine, but it would require subtlety rather than just jamming it in the audience's faces. If you try to force someone to listen to your message, they're much less likely to listen. The show should have just spoke for itself, but it didn't. That's why it had to say it for you. Because that message was not a part of the show. Mushishi handles this thing far, far better, and Parasite can only be laughed at for its attempts at sounding smart, or it thinks it sounds smart. Overall, it's just lazily written and tried to do too much. It should have just been an action show all the way through. Musically, like said, the dubstep does not allow for the atmosphere or tension in most situations to be very immersive, but overall it's not a bad soundtrack to listen to and is probably the strongest point of the show, funny enough. Though of course the problem is there really aren't enough tracks and it quickly becomes repetitive too. Everything about this show is repetitive. I, I, I hate to keep saying that, but it's true. Basically every episode will be playing Next to You or Hypnotic because it doesn't have enough variety to offer. It's a nice effort at the very least, but it was only enough for one season. Animation wise, I don't really have any complaints per se. There really aren't any scenes that stand out to me as impressive both in terms of animation or directing. Reiko's death scene is easily the highlight of the show, but still could have been done much better if you ask me. The only flashback Shinichi needed in this scene was that of his mother if you ask me, as it was the most relevant, rather than everything that could have made him feel emotional. Also, Murano coming in coincidentally to say, you're back, really killed it for me. Like, even if it's being faithful to the manga, that doesn't mean adjustments can't be made to make scenes more powerful. That's why several scenes in Hunter x Hunter are way better than its manga counterpart. Flexibility is a great tool to use, if you ask me. Otherwise, I feel they used all of their talent on directing Death Parade this season. 
I expected better from Madhouse, quite honestly. Even if this was faithful to the manga, which I'm not sure about because I will never read it or even be tempted to, it just wasn't an impressive show by any stretch. It's repetitive, it's childish, it's pretentious, and it's full of shallow characters with a shallower plot. There really isn't much good to say about it other than Reiko and Migi to some extent, I guess. I'm personally not sure why people love the guy so much, but I guess he's at least somewhat charming to a degree. To me, he's just kind of a like Ryuk from Death Note, but less consistent. However, I wish I didn't waste my time with this show, as it was, in my opinion, just a piece of shit without much merit.